Hello and welcome to the Optical Society webinar, Adaptive Optics, Latest Results in Vision Science, Microscopy, and Astronomy. I'll now turn it over to today's moderator, Jessica Pagonis from OSA. Jessica, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Marilyn. Hello, my name is Jessica Pagonis, and I am OSA's Corporate Program Manager. I, too, am pleased to welcome you to today's webinar sponsored by ALPO and, and presented by OSA Industry Development Associates. We have three speakers today. Our first speaker is Kai Wang. He is, our, he is a postdoctoral research fellow at Howard Hughes Medical Institute Hanelia Research Campus. His research interests lie at the interface of electrical engineering, nanotechnology, optics, and biomedical sciences. He received his BS in electrical engineering at Tsinghua University in Beijing and, produced, and pursued his PhD in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University. Our second speaker is Dr. Alfredo Dubra. Dr. Dubra started his physics training at the National University in Uruguay, followed by PhD and postdoctoral work at Imperial College London. A second postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Rochester led to the start of his own lab, which is now part of Advanced Ocular Imaging Program at the Medical College of Wisconsin. His long-term interest is the visualization of retinal structure and function to improve the diagnosing and understanding of eye disease. We pursue this goal through the incorporation of techniques and technology from optics, astronomy, image processing, electrical engineering, and biomedical engineering. Our final speaker is Francois Rigaud, Associate Professor. He is with the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the Australian National University. He obtained his PhD in 1992, working on the first ever AO system for astronomy named POM-ON. Since then, he has led the design and construction of many AO systems for medium and large telescopes, including GEMS, the Multi-Conjugate Adaptive Optics System for the Gemini 8N Telescope. And now I will turn it over to our first speaker, Kai Wang. Kai? Yes. Yes, thanks. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. And I'm a postdoc research associate at Betty Lab at Junior Research Campus. So today, I'm going to introduce you an adaptive optical microscope uh, we developed recently to achieve high-resolution subcellular imaging throughout whole living organisms. So as we know that optical imaging is a very powerful tool for biological studies and for in vivo optical imaging of biological process, uh, the requirements are multidimensional. For example, we want to have a high resolution so we can see smaller structures. We want to have high speed so we can catch fast dynamics. We want to, the imaging to be non-invasive so we can keep the biological sample live and healthy over a long period of time so that we can catch the entire biological process of our interest. And also we want to imaging deep into a biological sample because only in that case we can study biology in their native environment. We can study cell-cell interactions or even a large group cells all together as a system. So people have developed very promising approaches to do uh, re imaging at high resolution, high speed, and low invasiveness. But all of these methods cannot be applied to imaging deep or will have greatly compromised imaging performance when imaging deep into barrier samples. So I just want to show you a comparison. For example, if we want to image cells that are sitting on the curve glass, we have many options. In this example, we use three-dimensional structure illumination microscopy. You can see very small structures of the mitochondria in a living HeLa cell. We can appreciate the hollow structures of those subcellular organelles. However, if we also image the mitochondria, but in this case, in a living zebrafish brain, which is a, uh, in a cell that is about 150 micron below the surface, and this is typical image quality we can get with confocal imaging, and we can see we can't get any subcellular information from these pictures. That is because the biological samples are highly heterogeneous, and this heterogeneity will cause aberrations to prevent us getting good images deep inside our sample. Actually, we can directly visualize those heterogeneity using differential interference contrast imaging. For example, 
we look at the adopt C elegance using DIC, you can see a lot of small structures. And the reason we can see these structures is because they have different refine index. Then you can imagine how complicated this aberration can be caused by such highly heterogeneity in biological samples. And even more, the aberration, these aberrations can change very rapidly from positions to positions, and which makes the compensation of such uh, aberration in biological sample even more complicated. To deal with such uh, challenges, we are going to take two strategies. Uh, the first strategy, on one hand, we want to employ powerful adaptive optical correction methods, which can do correction at high speed, can make efficient use of all the photons, and can do robust correction all, on all different kinds of biological samples. And in the end, we decide to use direct wavelength sensing, uh, such as the shear Hartman wavelength sensor. On the other hand, because of the problem is so complicated, we try to simplify this problem as much as we can. So instead of looking for a complete local corrections, which can be crazily difficult and works only over a small field of view, we are trying to target uh, to find a, an optimal correction over a large volume, which could be easy to correct, and the one correction co can work over a larger field of view. And we found in our experiment that such an optimal correction can, can actually be achieved by doing average of corrections over a volume. So here is the way we implement such strategies. For so first one, direct wavelength sensing, we use shear Hartman wavelength sensor. The way it works is first to generate a pound source inside the biological sample. Uh, and due to historic reason, people call this pound source uh, as gas star. And once we have this pound source, we can use imaging objective to collect light from this pound source and place the uh, shake hard memory run sensor as the real pupil of this objective and measure the wavefront aberrations. The key of this method to work is to have a pound source inside the larger sample, and we can generate such pound source using nonlinear excitation. So the idea is that if we focus two photon excitation beam into fluorescent labeled sample in this picture, uh, we have a chamber filled up, uh, filled up fluorescent dye, then we can see the linear excitation will make use of endogen endogenous fluorescence and generate a very confined excitation over small volume. And this confined excitation can work well as a gas star. That's for the first, strat uh, first strategy. For the strategy two, we want to get the average averaging correction, and we found that it can be simply achieved by using D-scan. So the idea is that uh, we do not park the beam on a single spot inside a biological sample. We can scan this two photon excitation spot over an area or even a volume inside a biological sample. And all the fluorescent signals excited during scanning will be de-scanned by the same scanning mirror and directed to the SH sensor. The SH sensor will be kept on integrating during the whole scanning process so that which is equivalent to get average correction over that volume. So doing so gives us a list of advantages, advantages, including we can get a brighter guide star, we cause low damage to the sample, the correction can work over a large field of view, and the operation is very simple and robust because we don't have to worry about where to park the beam to generate guide star. We just simply scan over an area like we do imaging, then we, will do, uh, we can do correction at the same time. And the correction can be done at high speed depending on the brightness of the fluorescent labeled samples. And this method is not sensitive to animal movement, which is actually a very practical concern in working with animals. This method is not sensitive to gas star intensity fluctuation, uh, so we don't have to worry about photo bleaching. We can even use calcium of or even voltage transient in functional imaging of the brain activities to use such spontaneous fluctuation signals for wavefront aberration correction. We have combined this our, our AO method with two photon and confocal imaging modalities. In this system, we use ARPO default mirror, which has 97 actuators. Um, it can well deal with most of the aberrations we encounter in biological samples. And we also use a customized SH sensor, which consists of 12 by 12 micro lens lead array, 
and an endo EMCCD camera. So interchange between two photo and confocal image modes can simply be done uh, down by changing two decro mirrors sitting on two motorized stages. So using this system, uh, we demonstrate two color confocal imaging in liver zebra fish brain with AO correction. So this is the example I showed at the very beginning, which is 100 mi 150 micron below the surface of the living zebra fish brain. So we can see after AO correction, we start to see subcellular structures of the mitochondria inside this cell. And because we know that after correction, uh, that resolution is nearly diffraction limited. So we can further apply the convolution to better visualize those structures. And then we can appreciate how much more information we can get after correction. And we can also do uh, imaging of large Z stacks inside the living zebra fish brain using AO. And the top row shows us the image quality we can get with best efforts without AO correction with confocal imaging. And we can see that image quality from surface, uh, we can get pretty good imaging, but as we go deeper, the image quality is keep on de uh, decreasing. That is because barrier sample will cause aberration. But if we look at the bottom row, which is after correction, we can see that the resolution we can get on the surface is pretty much maintained all the way down to 200 micron deep into the living zebra fish brain, which is exactly how our able helps to maintain the resolution throughout the whole living whole stacks in the living zebra fish brain. And we found that the average actually changes very rapidly inside of the biology sample. In this example, we imaged the uh, brain a uh, region inside the hand of the living zebra fish. And we can see we do two corrections on two different regions indicated by the dashed box. These two regions are only 15 micron apart from each other, but we got very, two very different wavefront correction patterns. And these correction patterns only works very locally to, imp to improve, the, improve the image quality. That means we need to do many, many corrections to cover a larger field of view, which makes our method which can do correction at high speed very appropriate. The AO also enables us to study subcellular dynamics deep inside our living biology sample. In this example, we also image the mitochondria, and we can see after the AO correction, we can track the dynamics of the morphology change of the mitochondria inside this cell, and how the mitochondria is transported along cells to the axon far end to maintain their normal metabolic process. We also apply the AO correction on another uh, animal model, fruit fly, and we look at live a living fruit fly brain with our system, and we see strong aberrations, even one imaging depth is only 70 micron below the surface, and we need to do corrections on three different locations to improve the image quality at their own places. So to summary, so we have developed an adaptive optical microscope based on derived wavefront sensing. And this method consists of a uh, shirk and wavefront sensor, Lanier guide star, and D-scan. The combination of these three methods gives us a list of advantages which make this method very practical for uh, biomedical imaging. And we demonstrate great imaging quality improvement when we work with zebrafish and for fry when we combine AO with two photo and confocal imaging modalities. I want to mention that other, other than our approaches, there are also other AO correction approaches developed in bioimaging, such as sensorless AO, indirect wavefront sensing, phase retrieval and diversity, and all other methods. They all have their pros and cons. For example, they don't need a uh, wavefront sensor. They can tolerate tolerate scattering in certain signs, so on and so forth, and they are strongly motivated by their different applications. So in the end, I would like to thank my advisor, Eric Bezik, and all other lab mates in the Bezik lab. I would also thank my uh, special thanks to Dr. Narji Engineer and all other collaborators and people both inside Geneva and outside Geneva make this work happen. Thanks. With that, I will finish my part. Thank you, Kai. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about a particular application of adaptive optics within vision science, that is, 
of family imaging. And I would like to start by acknowledging that this is um, all the data I'm going to show you is really part of a collaborative effort with um, our basic scientists and clinicians at the Advanced Ocular Imaging Program, and also obviously the students and the staff that do most of the work. And in particular, I'm also going to show you um, some data from uh, our colleagues in New York, Richard Rosen and Topo Chui, uh, shown here about and I'd like to acknowledge also our sources of funding that are obviously essential for everything. And I would like to start with a more basic question of what is adaptive optics used for in the eye? And um, in terms of imaging, if you were to look inside the eye um, without adaptive optics and you were to zoom in uh, the retina and look at a very small portion, maybe only a couple of hundred microns across, you would see a blurry image. And that is because the optics of the eye are far from perfect and they're affected by monochromatic aberrations, chromatic aberrations, and intraocular scattering as well. Um, but traditionally, or until now, adaptive optics in the eye has really only focused on correcting the monochromatic aberrations. And when you do that, using a single wavelength of light, you can actually um, achieve the type of resolution shown here, where if you zoom in further and the image on the right, you can see individual uh, photoreceptors that correspond to the little bright dots that you see scattered all over the image. Um, so anyway, so the goal of um, doing adaptive optics in the eye, it really is to achieve diffraction-limited performance um, to see the structure and the function of the retina, not just structure as you would typically see in a, in a microscope. Um, an example of, uh, and the main reasons why we want to do that is because uh, we want to study disease. And an example of this is even though some, for example, some conditions where um, the disease is determined by the genetics of the person, even different people with the same genetic mutation might have different forms of the disease. And this is something that we can actually learn with adaptive optics. And it was very difficult to study with um, microscopy because some of these conditions are very rare, as, as rare as one in 50,000 or one in 100,000. It's very difficult to really get hold of uh, donor retinas. And then there's also the application of um, actually studying how a disease evolves. And you'd be surprised to learn that many diseases, some of them that are the most prevalent blinding conditions in the world, we still don't understand which cells die first. So we are, are trying to use adaptive optics to address that. And also, it's very important to study how uh, either surgery or drugs actually help treat uh, blinding conditions. And adaptive optics allow us to do that at a much finer scale, and that would allow shortening the uh, testing of these drugs, which means that a lot more drugs could be tested with less money, which obviously is going to benefit patients. And finally, one of the most important applications is to diagnose eye disease as early as possible. And this is very important because the majority, the enormous majority of the retina cells are actually postmitotic, which means they do not reproduce once the, the, the retina is fully formed. So from then on, you only lose cells as you age and because of disease. So, so to detect disease early is absolutely critical uh, for vision. And even though I'm not going to mention any uh, of these or discuss any of these in detail, I want to point out that there are many other applications of adaptive optics in the eye, including to study how cells are connected in the retina. Also, for example, to allow a subject to see through an adaptive optic system to simulate what their vision would be like if they had refractive surgery or a new type of intraocular lens, um, the type of lenses that you get implanted when you have cataract surgery. Uh, also to study whether aberrations play a role in things other than vision. And some people argue that aberrations could um, control some, some functions within uh, the eye and also um, how the eye even grows. Uh, and then finally, one of the more exciting applications is really is how to uh, test 
individual cells um, without having to, you know, if you were to deliver a spot of light to the retina without adaptive optics, you would, the, the optical blur would actually make you stimulate a lot of photoreceptors when you maybe want to be more precise and focus only a, ha a handful of cells or even just one. And an example of this is if you were to focus light onto these spots or, or, if, uh, or if you were to follow how some of these cones uh, that are the bright dots in the image change over time, uh, you would get something like a, an optical electrocardiogram, if you want, of a photoreceptor. And one of the things that we're trying to understand, and we and, and many others are trying to understand, if this can actually give you a clue of the health of the cells in the, in the retina. And if you allow me to... Uh, briefly review the uh, coarsely the optics of the eye uh, is typically formed in the, in the mammalian eye is formed by a cornea that has two surfaces obviously front and back and then you have a, a crystalline lens that is a slightly more sophisticated optical element because it has a, um, a non-uniform refractive index inside and these two elements are really what add uh, optical power to the eye and this um, eye changes, or is different for every species, and in particular, uh, there are three species that I mentioned here because are useful to study eye disease and to test new drugs and to understand how disease in humans actually work. And you can see that obviously the eyes are different, but if you were to scale them for a second so that they would all have the same size, there's very clear differences in terms of the curvature of the cornea and the size of the lens. And this actually it's important for adaptive optics because traditionally when you do adaptive optics with one deformable mirror or one corrective element, the assumption is that all the monochromatic aberrations can be thought of as coming through a sing from a single plane, uh, that is the pupil plane of the optical setup. And it turns out that if you look at different species of animals, this approximation might no longer be valid because as you can see, the back surface of the crystalline lens could be really far away from that pupil plane. So this points to the fact that maybe multi-conjugate adaptive optics might have a role to play in, um, in some of these animals um, to get really high resolution images. Um, if I could say briefly that most wavefront sensors in the eye are Schott-Harman sensors, although other um, sensors have been demonstrated, and, and one of the ones that's shown promise for, for animal imaging is wavefront sensorless um, or, or image-based uh, sensing. Uh, in terms of wavefront correction, liquid crystal displays and segmented deformable mirrors and bimorph mirrors have also been, um, have been demonstrated in the eye with, with moderate success. But in practice, the ones that are the most popular are continuous sheet um, deformable mirrors. And, and the form of mirrors for the eye have a, a, a somewhat unique specification because they really need a, a phenomenal amount of stroke to correct for the dominant aberrations that are defocus and astigmatism. And sometimes it could be achieved with different strategies that might require more or less. Um, you know, in this, uh, as I suggest here, maybe two deformable mirrors, one that has large stroke and low number of actuators, and then a tweeter that would be a higher number of actuators and, and higher pitch, uh, sorry, a higher and, and narrower influence function, sorry. I, I would also like to say briefly that in terms of the implementation of an adaptive optics and the control, most of thermoscopes for, um, with adaptive optics are arranged in a closed loop um, configuration, which means that the wavefront sensor sees not only the aberrations of the eye, but also the correction of the um, deformable mirror or other device you're using to correct for aberrations. And, and correction uh, uh, algorithms are usually pretty elementary. They're based on least square fitting of some sort, whether it's directly the slopes of the wavefront sensor or some polynomials. And non-common path aberration correction has been demonstrated, but it's rarely implemented. And finally, um, just to emphasize that the adaptive optics in the eye in some aspects is uh, still pretty young, is we haven't incorporated any prediction or, or um, accounting for statistics of the aberrations or, or even eye motion. So anyway, so a typical adaptive optics scanning instrument is something, looks something like this, that is here flattened uh, for, for clarity. 
and then this consists on an adaptive optics component, uh, an optical scanning, and an il illumination and detection arms. So if you were to, and this is completely analogous to a confocal microscope, um, and if you were to use this to image the living retina, for example, in human eyes, you would see structures like the cone photoreceptors or the cone and rod photoreceptors as shown here on the top uh, two images. Uh, and this is human, but we're looking in different parts of the retina. That's why the images look so different. Um, you can also use uh, single photon fluorescence as is shown on the top two images in this slide. And the image on the left shows some intrinsic fluorescence that we have in the retina, at least in the healthy retina. And then on the right side, you get to see um, fluorescein angiography, that is a technique that you can either inject some fluorescent dye in the bloodstream or drink it, and then you can actually see all the vessels and capillaries in the retina fluoresce when you illuminate with a blue light. And one of the things I'm most excited personally about is the possibility of using spectroscopic techniques to not just get a single wavelength image, but actually to explore the chemistry of each cell by using many different wavelengths of light, as is kind of hinted in the bottom two slides there. And everything I've shown you so far is, is a healthy retina, but there are a lot of uh, pathological or abnormal structures that you can study, and it's not everything about cone and rod photoreceptors, even though that is what adaptive optics in the eye has been used for the most. And, and again, just another example of um, uh, disease retinas, in this case, would be fluorescein angiography compared in a normal retina compared against retinas that are affected by different conditions. And you can see that there are different effects. Sometimes it could be less blood vessels, sometimes it could be um, uh, more uh, tortuous blood, uh, blood vessels. And this is a very active field because one of the most blinding conditions is really diabetic retinopathy. So if you um, eat um, very unhealthily and very heavy, um, if you look at one of these images, it actually um, makes you want to reconsider your diet. And this is an example of how adaptive optics can really help detect changes in the retina much faster than you can uh, in the clinic nowadays. And, and the image on the right, the three images on the right show on the top how you would see um, the retina in the clinic today. And then if you look with AO, and then before treatment and after treatment, and I want to point out that after treatment, you get to see the tip of the orange arrows point to a blood vessel that is, does not appear in the image above, and that means that it's actually working after treatment, and the same thing with the green arrow where the blood vessel has a gap before treatment but not after treatment. And this is a very fine capillary, so single cells has to squeeze by to get through. So this is the, the most sensitive imaging that you can do in the retina, really. And then one of the things that we discovered in the eye, so we're usually borrowing techniques from microscopy, but I think this is the first time we can contribute the other way, in the other direction. So we started using light outside the confocal pinhole to create images that are really um, derived from multiple scattering. And, um, and here's an, a, a brief schematic of, of how we go about it. And one of the most exciting applications really has been to image the photoreceptors, but a different part of the cells. In the top part of the slide, you get to see the images that we've been collecting until for the last 10 years, I would say. And then in the bottom part of the image, you get to see the matching uh, image with this non-confocal uh, light that reveals a different part of the cell. And even though you might say, well, this contains roughly the same amount of information, but actually it's because these are normal cells. So if you were to look at a disease cell, um, uh, you get to see how in the image on the left there are a lot of black holes uh, where there should be really a dot indicating that there's a cell. But then if you look on the right side of the image, you see these little bubbles that indicate that the inner segment of those cells is actually intact, or at least um, normal looking. And if you combine those two images, you get to see a lot of red bubbles that don't have a green dot in the middle. And that means that the cells are there, but the outer segments are somehow dysfunctional and, and this is, um, surprisingly, this, might, this is good news because it means that this person can benefit from gene therapies 
um, that are being developed now and are, are likely to, to actually maybe restore vision to this person in the not too distant future. And this is also a way uh, by using this non-confocal light, we can also um, see cells where the image that I showed you before is pretty obvious that every little hole somewhat corresponded to a cell, but in this case, it's not that obvious. And by going to the non-confocal image, you can actually see very clearly the cell boundaries and then you can compare that against a normal retina. And I would like to direct your attention to the bottom row of images that is um, the most striking. And the same type of non-confocal light could also be used to reveal the retinal vasculature, but this time without using a fluorescent dye. An example of that is uh, shown on the left side where you can see not only um, uh, vessels and capillaries, but you can even see in the thicker vessels, you can see the, the cells or the, or the wall um, of the vessels. And then by the, if you collect a movie of these images, and rather than calculating the average, you were to calculate the standard deviation, you get what is called a motion contrast image uh, that shows you where there is blood moving. And this is very uh, important because now we can do this without having to inject a fluorescent dye and without having to use visible light, which is uh, potentially toxic for sick retina. But anyway, so I would like to summarize by saying that even though adaptive optics for the eye is not um, a widely commercially available technique, it's actually a fairly mature research tool, uh, which doesn't mean that there are no unsolved problems. There are actually quite a few challenging problems that remain to be solved. So there are, job, there are quite a few jobs in the field. Um, still um, seeking for candidates. And uh, one of them is uh, dealing with cataracts. And, and this is something that is going to be very uh, challenging from the mathematical point of view because it's really imaging through scattering media. And a lot of uh, older people have a lot of scattering within the eye. And that really the next kind of um, big jump in degree of sophistication on adaptive optics is probably going to come through um, trying to image um, through these scattering media so that older people can are the ones that have stand to benefit the most really from eye care. And the other big um, challenge I think adaptive optics uh, in the eye has to address is the fact that longitudinal chromatic aberration is different for every individual. So there's a color dimension to adaptive optics in the eye that is missing and we're hoping to start exploring. And um, Anyways, and, and in addition to adaptive optics itself, once you have that implemented, there's a really a growing number of microscopy techniques that really have to be translated to the eye so that we can learn more about disease. Um, and this is all for me. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. I guess it's my turn. So. Um I'm coming last, but uh, actually adaptive optics for um, uh, astronomy uh, one of, was one of the first ones to see uh, the light. Um, um, and uh, you can see here uh, on the right, you have uh, the cover of a book that uh, was published, I think, about 10, 15 years ago, which states the adaptive optics revolution. And indeed, for, uh, for astronomy, uh, adaptive optics was really a revolution. Uh, from the Galileo telescope to about the 1990s, and telescopes were, were built bigger and bigger, but essentially they were just uh, capturing more light, and uh, there was no gain in uh, angular resolution. Up to uh, the early 90s, where uh, uh, people started to build adaptive optic system to uh, actually restore the ultimate uh, angular resolution or angular power of a telescope. Um, so you can see, um, I'm essentially going to focus on new aspects of adaptive optics and uh, not going to go a lot through the basis, the basics of it. However, I'm going to uh, spend a couple of slides uh, reminding people here uh, what it is. So um, here you can see, for instance, a typical image obtained with adaptive optics on the right compared to uh, the image obtained without adaptive optics on the left. So this is an image of the N13 globular cluster, one of the most known of the sky. And you can see the, the dramatic um, gain that you have uh, when you apply that to your optics. Uh, well, this, the, the gain that, that's brought by that to optics is, is twofold. 
first you see more details, and that's what is the most striking. Here, uh, for instance, you have in surface, you, you know, you can see about 50 times more detail on the AO corrected image than the non AO corrected image. And then something which is also very important for astronomers, you can also go deeper in the sense that you can um, detect fainter objects. You have more depth. And this is just because you are now concentrating the light of uh, the star here in this case uh, against a smaller patch of background. Therefore, your signal-to-noise ratio is increased. And uh, typically, you can gain uh, a factor of uh, um, about 4 to, uh, to 6 you know, in depth and a factor of 10 in linear uh, angular resolution. So um, adaptive optics for astronomy is slightly different than uh, what we've seen uh, up to now uh, with uh, Kai and Alfredo uh, for the, the, the microscopy and the, the eye. Uh, in a sense, it's a little bit simpler because uh, the aberrations are much less. We are dealing with a weak aberration. We are talking about you know, a micron to a few micron of phase uh, deformation. However, this micron to a few micron are still enough to totally destroy uh, or uh, largely destroy uh, your image quality. So in a sense, uh, here what we're doing is that we're using the light of a guide star and uh, just analyzing with a wavefront sensor and correcting with an adaptive optics mirror. Um, OK. Next slide. Uh, shows um, the huge progress that we've done in the past 20 years uh, applying adaptive optics techniques. So the first uh, adaptive optics system for astronomy saw first light in the 1990. And then, uh, as I show, uh, as I saw later, there was an explosion of, of system uh, around the world, in Europe, in the US mostly, and, uh, and now on other telescopes. So this is an example of uh, R136, uh, a star nursery. This is a star forming region. And uh, what you can see on the top left, uh, top right, sorry, is the result that was uh, obtained in 1992 with Common Plus, which was uh, one of the first TO system around, and where people also have applied the convolution on the, the top right image. The top left image uh, on these two images are, is the, uh, the sign limited image. So on the bottom right, you have uh, the same region uh, obtained uh, in 2000 with NAUS, which was uh, um, now on an 8-meter telescope uh, in Cerro Paranal at ISO, one of the VRT. And that's uh, already uh, better. What you see on the bottom left now is the, the same region image in 2013 by GEMS, which is a, a multi-conjugate adaptive optic system. Uh, fielded by the uh, Gemini Observatory, which is also an 8-meter telescope. So now you can see that on top of having the same resolution, now you have a gain also in field of view. And we are starting to really uh, compete with our images obtained with space, with this, uh, uh, including even better resolution, because the resolution being uh, in lambda divided by the diameter of the telescope, uh, and you can have much larger telescope on the ground that you have in space uh, for cost reasons. So uh, you generally gain in resolution uh, when you are on the ground using large telescopes. So it all started you know, in 1953 as far as uh, astronomical adaptive optics with uh, Horace Babcock uh, that proposed this adaptive optics con uh, concept to compensate for astronomical seeing. But it was too difficult. Uh, the technology was not ready. Um, the computer didn't exist. Um, so people just, you know, uh, shelved this idea and uh, thought about something else. However, in 1972, uh, within the DARPA programs, um, people thought, well, you know, maybe it's time to try this idea of adaptive optics. So, and they actually built and, uh, and fielded and tested successfully a system in a very, very fast uh, turnaround, maybe a couple of years. That was the first AO system ever. Um, Okay, in, uh, since uh, 1989 uh, through uh, about 1996, so we had the emergence of the first natural gas star a system for astronomy. And then uh, from there on, you know, it kind of exploded. There was a flurry of new concepts, uh, new uh, wavefront sensor idea also, an AO concept, and we had the first LGS system at the end of the 1990s. Um, the, I said, uh, a new wavefront sensor idea because this is one thing that characterizes, you know, uh, the uh, 
uh, astronomical application is that generally we deal with stars or galaxies uh, that are there, and we just observe the stars and galaxies, but they are delivering you know, an amount of photon that you can do nothing about it. Uh, so you have to actually deal with that, uh, be able to use very, very faint stars, and therefore uh, this uh, implication that uh, people started you know, to develop more efficient wavefront sensors for adaptive application. From the 2000 till now, um, AO, I would say now, I've, I've, bec I've, I've become mainline in uh, all major observatories that, have, that all have AO system, uh, most of them with laser guide star. We'll see uh, later on what it is. And now also the giant telescope project of the future, which is the European ELT, the Giant Magellan Telescope and 30-meter telescope, are all telescopes that have adaptive optics built in. And they could actually probably not be built, being so large, about you know, 25 to 40 meters in diameter, without adaptive optics. Um, okay, so now let's talk about new techniques and uh, the, the latest you know, concept. Um, now there is more than just classical adaptive optics with one deformable mirror and one wavefront sensor. Uh, we are talking about, uh, for instance, laser gas star adaptive optics. Uh, and this is, uh, I, will, I will come to that later, but essentially you are using a, a laser to create um, a guide star at 90 kilometers altitude that you are using, and, and you can point this guide star wherever, wherever you want next to your object of interest. Uh, there is also the ground layer adaptive optics, which uh, delivers very wide field, but only a partial correction. So you are, it's just a seeing improvement. You have multi-conjugate adaptive optics system, which deliver moderate, moderately wide field, but almost at the diffraction limit of the telescope. There is other type, like for instance, laser tomography adaptive optics and uh, multi-object adaptive optics and extreme adaptive optics. So all of these breeds of, of adaptive optics have, are actually tailored to a particular problem. Um, an example here uh, of a facility that has been that is actually uh, commissioned right now, as, as we speak at ESO on, on the UT4 of the VLT telescope is uh, the AO facility, which uh, includes a ground layer uh, component and a laser tomography uh, adaptive optics component. And uh, so in this upgrade, the uh, ESO has actually uh, totally uh, retrofitted the, uh, one of the uh, VLT to include laser gas stars, uh, several wavefront sensors at the NetSmith platform and uh, new technologies. This here is uh, one of the first images obtained with the uh, multi-conjugate adaptive optic system uh, at Gemini. Um, so multi-conjugate is essentially a, a type of, uh, of air system where you use several wavefront sensor uh, and through tomography of the uh, turbulence medium, you can reconstruct a 3D image of your turbulence. And therefore, if you use now a three-dimensional corrector or several deformable mirrors in, in series, you can compensate uh, in a three-dimensional fashion and therefore correct uh, fields that are uh, extended. In that case here, it's about uh, one and a half arc minute by one and a half arc minute. And uh, on the bottom right, this blue square here is a typical classical AO field that you obtain with a classical system. So you see the, the huge gain in uh, surface area that you have for the same resolution. So you multiply your, your information element by, by quite a bit. Um, extreme adaptive optics, so that's the almost latest skin in the block. Uh, extreme adaptive optics is not really a new concept, but it is a kind of classical adaptive optics on steroids where you have many actuators on your deformable mirror, you have many subapertures, so you can ac actually boost the correction and obtain uh, image quality that are near diffraction limited. So in terms of strain ratio, which is the measure of the image quality, 100% uh, being perfect. Um, now people are obtaining strain ratio of about 90 to 95% in the near infrared. So this is mostly geared toward planet imaging. And uh, what you see uh, on the bottom left here is a difference between the Palomar discovery image of uh, uh, GLIS 229B and uh, an HST image in the middle, and on the bottom, a Nikki, uh, Nikki image. Yeah. So you see the huge gain that you, you can obtain with this kind of application. Um, okay, so now we have uh, uh, also a new concept like uh, multiple object adaptive optics, which is uh, 
uh, represented on the, the bottom right here. What you do here is that uh, a little bit like laser tomography or multi-conjugate, you are sensing uh, the aberration over a finite field. And then through uh, tomographic reconstruction through uh, using computers, uh, you can uh, determine what the phase aberration should be in one direction and therefore uh, correct for this phase aberration using micro deformable mirrors uh, in front of each object of interest. Now I'm running a little bit out of time, so uh, I'm going to hurry a little bit. So this is image of a laser guide star. So as I was saying, if you don't have a laser guide star next to your object of interest, you can create your own. Uh, there is essentially two types of laser gas star, but mostly now uh, sodium laser gas star are used. Uh, the concept dates from 1985. Uh, these laser gas star are extremely useful. Uh, they come, though, with uh, their own limitation, and uh, mostly uh, the tick-tick indetermination. I, I won't enter into the detail, but uh, it's just uh, limiting still the application of laser gas star. So laser gas star kind of multiply by about 10, the, uh, the, the chance that you have to observe a given object, but uh, it doesn't provide 100% sky coverage. Um, there you have uh, an illustration that uh, now laser gas stars are rather prevalent. So uh, on the Gemini telescope, here on the left, you can see that uh, there is actually five laser gas stars creating a constellation of uh, five spots on the sky uh, on a square uh, basis and one in the center. Um, on the VLT, uh, now you have also, uh, from China, there is also a very nice effort to create laser gas star within the TMT, TMT consortium. And uh, from, for the past two or three years now, we have actually commercial product like the Toptica laser delivering 20 watt CW at 589 nanometer, uh, which are, as I say, uh, off the shelf product, which now simplifies a lot uh, uh, our applications. <coughs> Deformable mirrors, now there's also uh, many uh, manufacturers offering deformable mirrors. Um, it goes from deformable mirrors that are about one meter wide. Uh, you can see here on the bottom left, this is an image of the, uh, the deformable secondary of the uh, uh, LBT, the Large Binocular Telescope. Uh, you have now also large deformable mirrors uh, like the one developed for the EELT, uh, this, this is a deformable mirror, which is uh, 2.5 meter in diameter, so it's huge. And at the uh, opposite, for uh, very narrow field of view applications, uh, you have very small and compact deformable mirror, like, for instance, the Alpao or the Buster Micro Machine. And I will stop there, just uh, with an illustration of what uh, the, uh, MM, uh, the GMT, the Giant Magellan Telescope, will look like with uh, it's uh, actually the six laser beams here, and that's what uh, our group is working on right now. So thank you. Well, great. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have some time for a few questions. Um, we'll go and ask one question for each presenter. Our first question will be for Dr. Kai Wang, and the question is, what is the image quality when using deconvolution on the non AOA I mean I'm sorry, the non AO data? Okay. So uh so do deconvolution uh deconvolution only works if you know the uh pawn spread function. So uh without doing AO we don't know the pawn spread function so if we use the assumed ideal pawn spread function to do the convolution, the result is horrible. It's totally wrong. So um, we we cannot do that way. So yeah, it's not applicable to do the convolution before AO correction. It's only applicable if we do the correction. So that's my answer. Hope it answers your questions. Okay. Okay, great. Um, the next mm -hmm. question is for uh, uh, Dr. Francois. What actuator resolution is required to achieve the kinds of imaging improvements that you demonstrate? How does the sensor resolution compare to the actuator resolution? Nine quiz frequency or oversampled in space? Okay, I, I don't see the question written. Can you repeat the last sentence? It says, how does the sensor resolution compare to the actuator resolution. Okay. Yes. Okay. 
So um, now this, this uh, resolution and uh, the, the actuator spacing we call the pitch, for instance, and this is wavelength dependent. So usually uh, adaptiotics for astronomy, uh, we are doing that, we are correcting the image in the near infrared, meaning about 1 to, uh, to, to 2.5 microns. And uh, typically if you go to good sites, good astronomical sites where the turbulence is less, uh, this actuator pitch is going to be about 50 centimeter, 30 to 50 centimeter. So for the, the, the extreme AO system where we want to have really the ultimate resolution, then uh, this actuator pitch goes down to 10 to 20 centimeter. But typically it's 50 centimeter. And uh, the wavefront sensor is, is usually matched with that, meaning that you want one sub-aperture or one wavefront sensor sampling element per deformable mirror actuator. So I hope this answered the question. Great. Um, we have another question here for um, Kai Wang. How do you get the guide star to be a point source in the sample? Doesn't it go through all of the aberrations? Uh, sorry, can you uh, repeat that question again? Sure. Uh -huh. How do you get the guide star to be a point source in the sample? Doesn't it go through all of the aberrations? Okay. So how can I uh, get the guide star? So I'll show this pump right here. So we generate a pump source inside barrier sample by two photon excitation of an endogenous fluorescence inside barrier sample. So the, so the answer is that as long as the biological sample has any fluorescent labeling, we can perk beam there and do the in this scan, we can generate a uh, guide star by nonlinear excitation. So the, uh, if there's any aberration uh, making the guide star is not really well confined, but uh, because the way SH sensor works doesn't need to be a perfect spot, it can be an extended source. So we can do first run correction and then to make the guide star looks better, and then we do the second round correction, then the correction quality quality can be much more improved. So that's my answer. Hope it answers your question. Okay, great. And we have time for one more question, and this will be to Professor Dubrow. Could you please repeat what imaging modality was used to create the very nice color images of the RNFL and photoreceptors? Could you please also comment on whether those images have been published? Uh, yes. So these images were uh, collected um, using a red laser, a green laser, and a blue laser, and they were collected sequentially, meaning that we collected them, uh, each of them separately, and actually minutes apart from one another. And... Um, I think the images might have been published, but I'm not sure. Uh, if you're interested, I can you know, just write me, an, write me an email and I'll, I'll, I'll give them to you. Okay, great. Thank you all for presenting today, and thank you everyone for attending our webinar. We have completed our webinar for today, and have a great afternoon.